Uh, thanks very much. Uh, so yep, yeah, here we are today to talk about TypeScript. Um, we're going to code JavaScript like it's 2016. It's a pretty big topic, so we're going to go at a bit of a cracking pace. So who am I? Uh, I'm Ian Yates, as you just heard. I'm a long time coder. I'm a first time talker. Don't hold that against me. Uh, as you heard, uh, I'm a developer at a company called Medical IT. We make medical software. It's kind of in the name. It's enough about me. So support our sponsors. Uh, it's been a great day today so far. I think you'd all agree. Um, it wouldn't be possible without them. So if you can make use of their products, please do. I know I do of a couple of them. So what are we going to cover today? We're going to cover TypeScript. So straight from the horse's mouth, that's JavaScript that scales. It's a type superset of JavaScript that compiles down to plain JavaScript. It runs on any browser, any host, wherever you need it to run. JavaScript runs everywhere. TypeScript can run everywhere. But who's behind it? Why? It's a Microsoft project. Again, don't hold that against it. You can use it in lots of editors. Of course, it'd be usable in Visual Studio. But you can use it in Sublime. You can use it in Atom. You can use it in all sorts of places these days. We're going to use it in Studio Code today. Uh, I guess it saw a massive uptick in adoption uh, when the Angular team said they were going to use it for uh, Angular 2. And it's free, free as in beer, completely open source. But I'll go further than that. So it is JavaScript with some types, but they're structural types. It's not like C Sharp or Java, where I've got to define everything up front and it's very rigid and so forth, and everything has to implement what you're passing through. And we'll look at why that isn't shortly. And it compiles down to JavaScript, but it's the idiomatic JavaScript. If you were trying to structure your code really cleanly and for a large application, it's the sort of JavaScript you would be writing anyway. The other nice thing, kind of like uh, Babel, is that you get tomorrow's JavaScript features. You can have, have them today. <laughs> it's getting better all the time, but yeah. And you can have that down level in ES3 or ES5 in your browser. It's got a very low barrier to entry. Take a JavaScript file, rename it to TypeScript, so from your JS to your TS, and hopefully start catching some errors and getting productive. But there's also a low cost to leave. So if you give it a try and you use it for a bit and you find look, it's just not for me, no worries. Throw away your TypeScript, keep your JavaScript. It writes pretty good JavaScript anyway. Carry on with that. And uh, if you're familiar with the C Sharp side of the world, uh, where I spend the other half of my time, it's a bit similar to the Roslyn compiler. There's a language service and there's a compiler. And they're both, both of them in this case, is written in TypeScript. And they can be hosted in a variety of environments, which is why you can have that nice TypeScript experience in a wide variety of editors. So you know, why use it? Well, there's no shame in saying, why not let the compiler catch dumb errors for me? Um, it can be your first unit test. Uh, it can even be your only unit test, if that's the way you roll. Um, and why not have better documenting code? You know, we're going to be annotating some things here, and the compiler can help you with some other things and tell you what's coming out. And it can enforce some discipline. If you've got a big team, you can have some discipline there without having to use a linter and have lots of rules. The compiler has a lot of these things built in. But it is a big world, the JavaScript world. So we're not going to go into things like React or Angular 2, because I'm going to disappoint 40% of the audience either way, although that React talk earlier was pretty cool. Um, I don't use either of them myself, uh, so I shouldn't be up here talking about them. We're not going to go into big things like Webpack and System.js. If you're using them already, you can slot TypeScript in as yet another bit in your build chain. Um, and we're not going to run actually any code today, really. Um, so we're not going to get into Node.js or Cordova and so on. But of course, it does run in those environments. It makes JavaScript after all. There's quite a few other features, heaps of things in TypeScript we're not going to get into. Just going to get a bit of a taste today. And there are some other things. If you are on the CLR and you're using all the .NET code, and you've got some server-side ASP.NET, and you've got some client-side TypeScript, uh, have a look at the TypeLight project. It's really great. Let you take some DTOs from your server code and have them nicely, strongly typed in your client-side code. So what are we actually going to do today? We're going to talk about types. Uh, it is TypeScript, after all. But that means we're going to look at some type checking. We're going to look at transpilation, how TypeScript can compile your code notionally. We're going to have a little bit of a look at how you can configure some of the build stuff. And then we're going to get into all the types of types. Simple types, property bags, type inference, tuples, arrays, interfaces, classes, union types, intersection types, where it starts getting a bit fun. We're going to look at namespaces and modules, how we can structure these bigger projects we're making. 
going to hopefully get to some async and await. And in your classes, it handles things like this and Lambda, which is what you get in ES6, but again, you can have it in your current JavaScript today. So I hope you leave here today with an appreciation of what TypeScript is, why it exists, how it can help you in your code. And we're going to look at some type definitions later on. You're going to run into some of them in the wild if you uh, try and use TypeScript yourself, and some of them are going to have some pretty dodgy definitions. Uh, so we'll look at how we can fix up a couple of them. And you can gradually transition to TypeScript one file at a time. So let's have a quick look at uh, a tiny little bit of code. So I have here a bunch of files. I'm using Visual Studio Code. Can everyone see that OK? No, I'm in the dark theme, sorry. Uh, I can switch that if someone tells me how. I don't mind. Um, I've got some text files here I prepared earlier, just because I'm. you don't want to watch me type. I'm going to rename that to TypeScript, and straight away, things have lit up for me. So it's going to, I'm writing plain JavaScript here, var n equals 1. Lo and behold, it knows n's a number. I've assigned it a number. I've got s being 1, 2, 3. Hey, look, it knows s is a string, because I gave it a string. I can assign that here as well. You'll note that it's not complaining at me that I've defined that variable afterwards. But it does enforce things like, hey, I've got my let's here, and I can't use that before it's defined, which is what we expect from the let statement in JavaScript. It's aware of things like Booleans and so forth, but it can also take, go a bit step further. If we're doing constants and we're in the new version of TypeScript, which is uh, just coming out, and we'll get to that, it can actually infer a bit more from constants and say this is more than just a Boolean. It's actually got the value true, and it can use that in some of the decisions it's making for you. Of course, because n's a number, I can do things like to string. I can also call other things on there. So I'm getting automatic IntelliSense there. Again, it's aware of Booleans, it's aware of dates. It's got generics, so I can make a new array. This array is going to have numbers. That means I can do things like a0 equals 1, 2, 3. But I can't do a0 equals like so. And I get pretty good error messages out of there saying, hey, I'm expecting a number. You've given me a string. Naughty. Now, I can just, this is, again, plain old JavaScript code. So TypeScript's saying, well, you haven't told me anything about that, so I'm just going to assume that's the any type. That's your get-out-of-jail-free type, effectively. It's like variant from the old VB days, I suppose. But I can get specific and say, hey, look, this thing's, it's going to definitely be a number array, so that's how I can define that. And I can come here and say, hey, yep, push two into there. And you'll notice it's complaining at me here. This is one of the things I'll talk about later on, where we can have TypeScript check for us, hey, have you definitely assigned this variable yet? It's a feature called strict null checking that came in the recent version too. And so it can be aware that if I do things like, for example, hey, I've now definitely assigned that to some empty array, it's now happy to let me use it. That one's going to be an any. I didn't tell it anything about the types. And then there's this sort of thing here. You know, what is that? We're in the world of JavaScript, so these sort of things happen. I might well have a string. I might have a number. Rand is effectively a simple function. It's going to return a boolean. Sometimes it'll be true, sometimes false. And by the way, if the gods are smiling at me, I can hit F12 and go to that code. And you can see that there. So that is going to be a string or a number. It's exactly what it is. And we'll look at them in a moment. It's also got enum support in there. So I can have this thing called a fuel type. And you'll see I've defined three things in here. I've got diesel, petrol, and jet fuel. And it's automatically assigned those numbers in the order I've defined them. Much like if you've done C sharp, you'd be familiar, or quite a few of the other languages work the same way. And if I need to, I can say jet fuel is really awesome, and it's now got a value of 100. And it's quite happy with that. Now here you'll see, for example, I've got a function, and I have no idea what I am. have to have a name. And I can get nice IntelliSense here. For example, if I have my FT being fuel type dot, and I get assistance there, and you can see it knows jets 100 and things like that. Now, you'll notice I'm putting some type annotations on my code. But here, for example, I've got a function called do it. I'm just returning a string from that. And it's able to infer, hey, this function's always going to return a string. So that when I have var done equals do it, it knows done is a string. These types will automatically flow out through with the system for you. I can say, hey, look, uh, I'm going to do it with some parameters. So param one's a number. Param two is also a number. But I've also said, hey, let's make that a little smaller. 
It could also be a string. And so it's aware of that. I can also have optional parameters. And these are things that are coming into ES6 a little bit too. I'm going to have an optional parameter where it's going to be number, or if I don't pass one in, it knows it could also be undefined. And that'll be important when we look at some of our code later on. And so I can call optional stuff here and leave it blank, but I also get nice IntelliSense again without having to do anything to say I could pass a number, but it knows I can't pass in things like false because I expect a string or a number there, or a string in that case, sorry. It can also do default parameters, so I can have a function here and I say, well, should I do it? And we're used to things like, I guess, in C sharp and so forth, at least I have been, where, okay, I've got should I do it, and I can give it a constant there, I can't do much else. But we're in the world of JavaScript here, anything goes. So um, I'm gonna make it uh, random every time. It'll happily go off and run that function if I don't pass in a parameter. We can do lambdas. We can also do, uh, here's a function. I've said, look, hey, this function definitely needs to return a number. I'm not returning a number in here. I'm gonna get the appropriate red squiggly line. We can do callbacks and so on. You can get quite complicated with these type parameters. You can define new types since here yourself. You should say, for example, I need to get an engine and it's gonna have a number of cylinders and it's gonna have, uh, I don't know, a fuel type. If I can type properly, but I can't, so we're not gonna worry about that. But we can define types in there. I don't have to necessarily have defined these things called interfaces and classes. I can just say, look, give me an engine and it better have a cylinders property. Other things, very quickly, we can have tuples or tuples, depending on what part of the world you come from. So I can have this function, for example, it takes in a number and I'm gonna have an, a thing coming out of it. It's really just an array in JavaScript world, but it's definitely gonna have a number and a string and a Boolean in there, in, in that order. And so I'm gonna return that. I'm just making up, hey, give me A, give me A as a string and give me not not A, which is a cheating way of making it uh, effectively a Boolean. Um, and it knows though that if I pass in something to this tuple maker, I'm getting out this thing that is gonna be a number string Boolean. And so when I access the second thing on there, I can say, hey, that's definitely going to be a Boolean because it knows, it knows that. And it also knows that I can't do things like out four in a perfect world. Don't stress about that. <laughs> Did for me yesterday at least. Um, we can also do things like destructuring and so forth, where, for example, I know this is passing out a tuple and I can do out one, out two, and out three, and start using those without having to assign to temporary variables and so on. And that's something that's coming into ES6. So there's a, quite a few features uh, that are there where you can get benefit just from returning things from your functions and so forth, which you're already doing in JavaScript, and it can infer what's coming out of that. All you really need to do, put types on at a minimum, is say, hey, my contract is, you should be passing me a number here, you should be passing me a string. That's not necessarily a bad thing to have. It's good documentation anyway. So we looked at a whole lot of built-in types before. Enums, as you saw, work as we'd expect. So before we get too much further, uh, TypeScript yeah, it does have a compiler, so how can we configure this thing? One easy way, and the way I've done it for a fair while actually, um, you can just do it ad hoc. So you can load up Visual Studio 2015, 2017, 2013. Um, make a file, give something, 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 .ts, uh, save it, and you're gonna get a JavaScript file right alongside it. The recommended way these days, and the way I've got it on here, is we can have a tsconfig.json file. Uh, and in there, there's a whole lot of options. I've started bringing up some of its IntelliSense there. But there's a whole lot of options you get in there. How strict do you want the TypeScript compiler to be? And what extra bells and whistles do you want it to do? Do you want it to make source maps? Do you want it to put the JavaScript out to a certain folder? Now, it's important that you uh, look at that configuration file and configure it, because there are new versions coming out of TypeScript every couple of months, frankly. Um, for the last two years, we've had a whole number of versions from 1.1 through to 2.1 has come out in 2017 uh, R2 or RC. I'm running 2.2 developer preview on here, which is what we're running today. Um, and for the most part, they're backwards compatible. I've found when I've upgraded the bits of my code that tended to have gone bad, so to speak, according to the compiler, are bits that were probably a bit dodgy um, in retrospect anyway. Um, so I've always uh, found those things welcome. 
And that configuration file, which we'll have a look at now, is important because we can change just how strict we want to be and do we want to opt into some of the new features. So for example, strict null checks is a new thing that came in in TypeScript 2 and it can enforce in your code, hey, if you've passed in something that may or may not be undefined, I'm going to complain at you unless you've actually done a check to see is it null or not. Um, things like no implicit any, can I be lazy and just put a parameter on there or do I want to have these types specified? Do I want source maps there or not? The other important thing here is what are you targeting in terms of the down level code, the JavaScript that it's going to emit? You can change that here. So let's have a look at some of that JavaScript quickly. So if we look at what we did with uh, tuples, for example, if I save that, I'm just going to crank up the TypeScript compiler in the background. Uh, it's Control Shift B in the Studio code. And we're going to go and have a look at DDD4 JavaScript file. And you'll see here that we've got our simple function. It's returning some plain JavaScript. Don't worry about this little function wrapper. We'll get to that in a minute. And I've got my other code here. And the destructuring you'll see is the key part here. Then it put it out into a temporary variable for me. And then from that temporary variable, it's assigning out to those three variables I made. So you'll see here I had my nice destructuring card command here. Now, if I go back to our tsconfig file, and I say, hey, look, I'm uh, living in the future. Maybe I'm running on Node. I'm just going to crank up my compiler again, terminate that, and start up. And it's, that's the JavaScript it's made, which is effectively exactly the same as the TypeScript. So yeah? Beg your pardon? So what location? Oh. Yep, fair enough. So uh, it's in the root of this, um, well, loosely packaged up set of files. So this tsconfig here, it's a bit hard to, I'm, I'm not usually a user of Studio Code, sorry. But if I get rid of all these folders, we've effectively got, apart from all my text files here, I've got this tsconfig sitting in the root. I've also uh, run npm only just to go and get the latest version of TypeScript. Out of the box, you can just run TypeScript code in here. Um, you're just going to get the version 2.0 of the compiler. And I wanted to get some async await stuff. Uh, but yeah, tsconfig, put it in the root. That's where it's looking to find it. So with our ES6 target, we're going to get newer features. Um, not in our TypeScript, but what's omitted. So type inference. Because you don't want to have to put types on everything. We saw that when we had some return types, it worked out what was happening. And you can see here it's saying, hey, S, that's clearly a string. That X, that's obviously a number. But we can also do just loose property bags. And this is where we're getting into this structural typing and how it can match types to each other. So I can make up this variable called a car. And we're going to deal with cars and vehicles a lot in this. I can have a number of wheels, a number of seats. And it's got this engine here. And look, I'm a bit lazy. I'm not going to make up a separate engine interface or anything like that. But it knows, hey, look, this car happens to have an engine. It's got some cylinders, which is a number, and fuel is a string. Structuring your code, there's namespaces and modules in TypeScript. And after all, the whole mantra of TypeScript was to have JavaScript that can scale to large projects. So there are two keywords involved in namespacing your code. And lo and behold, one of them is called namespace and the other one's called module. In early versions of TypeScript, all we did have was module. They're kind of interchangeable. The module keyword comes into play when we're doing a whole lot of uh, common JS, require JS sort of stuff. We're not going to get into that today, but it allows you to um, working with those various module systems. Uh, so we're not going to get to that um, just because there's too much to go through. But these namespaces, no matter how you're pack packaging things up, um, there's this revealing module pattern that they, that they make. And it's effectively keeping some things private and you can expose some things to be public. The shortest definition I could sort of find of that was from Pluralsight. Um, but basically, if you don't want to read all that, because I certainly don't, we can have this calculator, for example. And it, here's a function, and we're going to execute that function immediately. And what's in here is our private state. And whatever we return from there ends up being what consumers of that calculator can call. It's basically how you can namespace your code in JavaScript. I'll have a quick look at interfaces, and then we'll get back to some code. So we've got this thing. It's called a car. We were looking at it before. 
So let's formalize it a little bit because maybe I'm making a library or I just want to be strict and I want to say, hey, I'm definitely going to have these things called a vehicle coming in and I want to get a bit uh, more structure around things. So I'm going to have a definite fuel type. I'm going to have that enum we were looking at before. Um, that I prefix, um, it's been creeping into a lot of new TypeScript code I've been seeing. Originally, it wasn't really around there that much. And you'll note again, I'm not going to bother making up a separate I engine. We're going to use this interface now. We're going to, hey, let's make an iVehicle, and we're going to, let's just get into the code, hey? You can read that. So, type inference, one key thing to know about. You're in the browser, you're going to be making elements, um, unless you're using some nice templating engine, which we all do. But if I call document.createElement, I'm going to get a video element every single time. So TypeScript can be aware of that. And because I've called document.createElement with a certain constant string, it can tell me that, hey, you're getting back a video element object. You're not getting back just some random HTML element. And that would be different from a paragraph element because I've called that with createElement p. And so you can define a whole lot of function overloads if you needed to, to say, because I got past this certain constant or because I got past a string, I'm returning different types. And if you come from, say, the C-sharp world, you can't do that kind of thing. You can't vary a function's return type with different overloads. I mean, JavaScript, TypeScript, that's the sort of thing we do all the time. So we won't dig into that too much. I've got a huge example there. We might come back to it later on because we'll keep things moving. So we're going to have our namespace here. We've got our DDD namespace. We're going to keep on using that from now on today. And here's our fuel type. And again, I've got my awesome jet fuel. And I've made this vehicle. And we're going to pretend those things don't exist for the moment. And so I've got wheels, I've got seats. And for something to be a vehicle, it needs to have these things at a minimum. It doesn't have to be exactly those things. And what I mean here is I have a car and I'm saying, hey, this thing, it has to conform to a vehicle. Now, when I'm making one directly, TypeScript's going to help me. And it knows, OK, well, vehicles should have. I'm missing the seats. And again, I get a fairly verbose error message there, but it's also quite specific about what the problem is. It's saying, hey, you've got this loose property bag, and you're trying to match it to this iVehicle type, uh, and you're missing the seats, and it should be a number. So no worries. I'll get some help there. I've got four seats. And it's happy. But I can also do things like, hey, I've got a weekend car, and I'm just making up a loose bag of properties. And so TypeScript's just inferred, hey, you've got this new type you've made up. It's this new structure. It happens to look like a vehicle, but it also has some more things on there. And that's OK. I can do things like, I've got my weekend car. It's got jet fuel. It's got 12 cylinders. It's awesome. And I can assign weekend car to car. And that's OK. So I can give the types of those two things aren't exact. I never said weekend car was a vehicle. It just happens to satisfy all the things that a vehicle needs. And so that's where the power of TypeScript comes in. You can mix together different libraries or say, hey, I've got a function which just needs to say, uh, I don't know, it's a seat counter. And I just need an object which happens to pass in the number of seats. That's all I need. I've got my object. And I can do things like seat counter and pass it a car. And it's happy. I can pass it something that, that oversatisfies it. That's OK. But if I said it also needed to know, I don't know, how many frobs it's got, or maybe frobs is a string, suddenly car doesn't satisfy that anymore. And so it looks kind of Mickey Mouse when it's all in the same file. But the nice thing here is that when you're refactoring your code, or you're in a big team, or you're using a third party library, which has started changing maybe what it expects, you're going to start getting warnings throughout your code rather than finding them out in runtime or finding them out in your tests, I suppose, uh, if you've got tests covering those things. The other things I can do, though, for example, apart from having my seat counter, which we'll get rid of, I can have optional things on my interfaces. So I could say, look, cars may well have an optional eject seat. So I've got this little question mark here at the end, so I don't have to pass it in. But the other thing is, when I pass it in, it's not just going to be a string. It's not just going to be a number. It's going to be these specific values. This is called a union type. So these are constants. And this is a fairly new thing in TypeScript. And it's getting better all the time with what it can do with it. But it can then start checking my code even more to say, look, I can pass in hard there. 
But if I pass in something that doesn't quite conform to that, again, it's going to start warning me and saying, hey, this type, this constant of whatever that I typed, isn't one of zero, hard, soft, or undefined. And you'll, no you'll notice it says undefined there because I've got that question mark, which I made it optional. Even though it's optional, it still has to be one of those things. So I'll scrap that just because it'll ruin my demo later if we leave it in. So we had a quick look at some of the code. We didn't look at the generated output. We should do that quickly. We'll go to DDD7, hey, because that's interfaces. Perfect. So you'll see that namespace we had before. We had namespace DDD, and we were exporting things from it. That's making it available to other parts of our application. So that I can do from outside that namespace, ddd dot, and start seeing what was in there. But you'll notice, for example, I don't see weekend car in my list because I was not exporting my weekend car. If I do so, and I might even make it a constant because I never want it to change, now I've got my weekend car on there. And the way the JavaScript looks, a couple of things to note. One, there's nothing in there saying iVehicle. These interfaces that we define in TypeScript are completely erased in the JavaScript. They're just there to help the compiler and, and your productivity. Um, the other thing is, here's this revealing module pattern. So I've got this function which takes in a ADDD thing that we made. We're adding a whole lot of things to it. And then we're sort of returning it and then we're self-executing it. And the way they've written that means that you can have other namespaces also extending DDD. So I can have namespace, or well, let's use the module keyword because it's the same diff. And I can do uh, export var x equals four. And you'll see in here, we've got a second revealing module pattern, which happens to add to the previous one. So you can have this module spread over multiple files if you needed to. So we've avoided classes up until now. Um, so classes are a thing in ES6. Some people think it's gonna be great. Other people hate them, they're there if you want them. Um, the nice thing is, I find that they handle the this pointer for you. Um, when I came to JavaScript from a originally Delphi and then C Sharp background, um, you know, the this pointer, I understand it now, but it was a bit of a weird mystery to me at the time. And again, they're really just another form of that revealing module pattern, but there's some more state in there, I suppose. And you can have some statics. So we'll have a quick look at that, because they kind of work as you'd expect. I won't rename our JavaScript file. Let's go and rename our TypeScript file. So I can have this thing called a class. I'm exporting it from my DDD7 namespace. It's got a constructor. And on this constructor, I can say, look, I expect this, op this open param. It's its name, it's a number. And I've put public on there. So I don't have to go and define yet a separate field or a separate property or whatever. I can also do fancy things like make that read only if I get things in the right order. I'm not going to worry about that. But there are other modifiers you can put on there. I can make things private. And this one, of course, is only going to be available in the constructor. It's not going to be available to the rest of the class. And I can put on here that I expect to be given a vehicle or I expect to be given undefined, but you better give me one of them. You can't just leave it off. I can put a function on the prototype of this class. And if you're not familiar with what prototypes are in JavaScript, they're its way of doing inheritance uh, effectively. Um, and if we have a quick look at that generated code, you'll see here that I've got a funk on the prototype and we're seeing, oh, here we go. So I've got the class keyword showing up in there. Anyone think why it's still in my JavaScript? Yep, because I forgot to do that yesterday too. I'm, at least I'm not surprised. So we go ES3, why not? And I'll restart my compiler. Crank it up again, flick back to our, the control tab does not work the way I'd expect in here, eh? Classes JS. And now I've got that more familiar, if you were trying to write a class-like thing in classic JavaScript, you would make a function and it ends up being a constructor function. Uh, and I sort of encapsulate it in this variable and it self-executes itself. And because I'm putting it in the DD7 namespace, it's done that for me. And you'll see here that it's put on the prototype this function, this public function. It's on the prototype. Everyone can call it. Similarly, though, 
if we go back to classes TS, I can have things like lambda functions. Let's get rid of that safety rating because I commented that out before. So I can have a lambda function, um, and this is where the this pointer is handled for you. So you don't have to call dot bind. And if you're not familiar with that, don't worry about it. Just use TypeScript, and you don't have to stress about it anymore. Um, so I can have a lambda function here where it takes in a seat count. I don't have to put it in there that that returns a vehicle. Frankly, I can just return something that looks like a vehicle, but it might be nice to others using the code that, hey, this really better be a vehicle, or because I add more things to vehicle later because I'm refactoring, that, hey, that'll start being caught for me. So I'm gonna say, yeah, this really better return a vehicle. So if I start not returning things from here that are required, again, it's gonna tell me, hey, you're supposed to return the number of wheels. So I'll get my six wheeler back. There are other ways I can do that, of course. I don't have to put it on the lambda of that return type. I could, for example, say um, in here that this bag of properties, again, better be a DDD I vehicle. So there are a few ways to specify that. And if you are doing React code, uh, you'll notice that that angle bracket would start causing you grief because you'd be expecting to put some HTML in here. So the other way of doing that is that you can at the end here go as like so and cast it that way. It's something that added a few versions ago to make uh, React integration a bit better. That's about it for classes, really. Um, again, like, they work as you'd expect, I suppose. So getting into some of the fun stuff now, because JavaScript is a loosely typed thing, um, but we're trying to bring some rigor to that, we need to be able to adapt to this Wild West, so to speak. So I can have a function, and it takes in a string or a number, and that's fine. And what I can invoke on those two things then, as far as the compiler is concerned, is I can call things that are on both of them. And that only happens to have two string and value of in common. But I can do type narrowing. And this has been getting better progressively in newer versions of TypeScript. So that if I write the JavaScript that I would have written anyway to say, hey, if I got a string come in, let's do some things with the string you gave me. TypeScript's now aware that that is definitely a string. And in my else clause, because the only other thing it could be was a number, it's now really aware that that's a number. And that's a really useful thing to have in your code. We can also do the opposite though, we can intersect types. And so that's like mixing things in. It's saying I've got a vehicle over here and I've got something that can act like a plane and I want to have something that covers both of those. And so it's almost widening your types, I suppose. And we'll come back to that in the final demo where we make a function which makes flying vehicles. But the other big thing is, uh, look, there's new JavaScript libraries all the time. I was reading about some on the phone this morning. And so we have these type definitions because these JavaScript libraries aren't written in TypeScript, but we need to interoperate with them. So they're kind of like a C header file, but they're just not as scary. And effectively what it means is it's a, look, trust me, these things are going to be on here. When I put a dollar sign there and I've said go get the jQuery type definition previously, it knows that when I do dollar dot, what can happen from that? And when I do dollar and pass in a HTML element, I'm going to get different things back from when I do dollar open brackets and put a function in there. It's aware of that from these type definition files. But still very much a trust me, it's going to be there at runtime kind of thing. So just because I get the jQuery type definition doesn't mean I've got the jQuery code. You still need to go and include that in your page, whether you have it in ASP.NET bundles or however you're including it. There's a few repositories of those. Uh, definitely typed is the big one. Um, and there's a few ways of getting things from that. That's a GitHub project where people have put up there, hey, here's what a jQuery thing looks like. Here's what underscore looks like. So uh, let's go and uh, have a look at some code. We'll bring in some external dependencies. We'll hopefully get to some async and await. And uh, we'll even maybe look at some of the constant types. And I'm gonna be pretty happy if we get through this in the next five minutes. So, um, so I'm going to have my namespace DDD. You'll see I'm doing it in the same namespace, just because I felt like it. And I'm going to export out of here this thing called a plane. And planes happen to have a number of seats, kind of like a vehicle. And we've got wings, which is just going to be a string, and propellers. Now, there's a couple of ways I can say, look, I'm going to have this thing called a flying vehicle. And if you've come from an OO background, you'd say, okay, I'm gonna have this interface and it's gonna extend plane, it's gonna extend vehicle, and that's great. And because of the type of seats, they've both got number of seats, that's great. But if for some reason planes maybe 
seats as a string. I'm running into problems here because I've got plane and vehicle and things are colliding and it's not going to be terribly happy with that. So I'm just going to put that back to being a number because that's what makes sense anyway. But there is another way to combine these types, I suppose, and specify that what I'm returning happens to be a plane and a vehicle in terms of what it can do. And that's this intersection operator, this ampersand. So I can say, take things that are plane-like, things that are vehicle-like, and that's a type that I'm just making up on the fly called flying car. And if I'm feeling really loosey-goosey, I can also say planes happen to have, I don't know, um, a number of pilots. You don't have to have defined interfaces. You can just make up, this is what this extra type looks like, and maybe the pilots are even optional because it's a self-flying plane or something. So from there, that means I can do things like var a is a flying car, and I get some helpful IntelliSense, and I get some type checking and, and so forth from there. Now, again, that's all been done in the one file, but picture this being spread across a big project, and that's where the benefit of this can start helping you. And I can do things like a.wings and get that type checked. I'm not going to worry about that because we're going to get to the fun stuff. So again, just because I felt like it, we're going to export a constant from here. The constant happens to be called convert with flight. And it's a function, which I've defined as a lambda. So it takes in this thing called a vehicle. So the only type I'm really putting on here is, hey, you better pass me a vehicle, which I don't think is too big a deal. And I've brought in underscore. Uh, if some of you aren't familiar with underscore, it's like doing link uh, in the browser. It gives you a lot of those sort of map and reduce sort of functions. But it also has nice things like uh, extend, where I can say, well, here's, here's an empty object and assign the properties of this into it and assign the properties of that into it. Now, the problem with extend in the default underscore definition is you can see there that it's got any, any, any. It's that get out of jail. Look, I'm just going to pass some types in. I have no idea what I'm going to give you back, which doesn't make the result very friendly because it's just any as well. It's not going to really help me, and I think we can do better. So if we F12 on that, you'll see that it takes me to this .d.ts file, which I fetched. I won't worry about it here, but I installed typings into my Visual Studio code which allows me to go and get those things from definitely typed. And I can say, go look for a thing called underscore. See if you can find any type definitions for that. And it's found one on definitely typed called underscore. I'll install that globally. And yes, please save that. And it gives me this file. I, I did it earlier. Yep. Now, we've got these types here saying any, any, any. I'm not particularly happy with that. I should probably make a pull request later with what we're going to change. So I'm going to get rid of that and pretend it's not on there. Now, if we go back to our mm -hmm, ddd8, look at our TS file. You'll see I got rid of that, so I've got the squiggly line, no problem. I happen to have prepared this earlier. And so on this underscore type that was made up, and they called it underscore static, because it's the stuff that's statically available under, after that underscore dot, I'm going to say, well, I can have generics in here, and I can say if I'm given two types, a destination and a source, they just happen to be T0 and T1. The result is the intersection of those two things. I've taken the properties from this one, the properties from that one, brought them together. That's intersecting. Again, I can do it for this arity. I can keep going and going and going. And what that means, though, in our code here is that it is now aware that this result is this empty type we had. It's a vehicle, and it's got these other properties. And those properties happen to satisfy enough to make it a flying car. But you'll notice I haven't actually said on there, by the way, I return a flying vehicle. But uh, TypeScript's happy with that all the same. So that I can go, for example, and utilize our functions. And for example, say, I've got this thing called fcar. It better be a flying vehicle. And I can say, hey, yep, yeah, pass in my car vehicle we made earlier and convert that to flight. Yeah, that's that ugly type signature that we didn't have to specify the return type necessarily but it's happy with our code that it happens to conform enough to that interface, even though it's actually returning slightly more, that even more number. I can also, just for my own sanity and maybe to help me with this, I can say, hey, you definitely return iFlying Vehicle, and it's type checked for me anyway, so that if I did leave off the wings, I'm gonna start getting problems. So it's up to you how you wanna drive that sort of thing. 
So one last thing we'll do is we're going to pretend we're calling a quick web service. That's an asynchronous process. And that's my 40 minutes. So it's an asynchronous process. I'm going to pass in a vehicle type. It better be weekday or it better be weekend. It better be one of them. And just because it's what I've used in the past, we're going to say, hey, um, here's some promise-based um, promise code. We're going to call jQuery. Then we're going to do something. We got back this fetch result and we're returning different stuff. It's the classic asynchronous code you'd have to write in JavaScript. So there is a nicer way we can do it now. We can do it with async and await in TypeScript. But you'll see here I've got this problem. It's saying, hey, you're down compiling to ES3, but you haven't told me necessarily there's a promise in the world around, um, around your environment. So we'll quickly tell it that and say, trust me, I have the DOM available and I've got a fairly modern one. Otherwise, I could have put in a promise uh, shim, a promise library. But now I can do things like, OK, I'm going to await the result of that uh, JavaScript service. I can tell it, because jQuery is not going to tell me, that it's an iCar fetch result, wasn't it? Yep. And I can then do, OK, well, if I got given a weekday, fine, return something. Otherwise, it knows, because we ruled that weekday, we must be in weekend mode. Now, if I do things like uh, that, because it knows that VT has to definitely be weekend, it can tell me, hey, you've probably made a mistake here. So even though I'm comparing against just a plain old string, because I've been fairly definite about the types of things I can accept, it can still type check that for me, which is pretty cool stuff, I thought. And if we look at the generated code, and this is the last bit we'll look at, we'll go to our DDD9, uncomment that, so we've got an asynchronous function here, which effectively calls that thing that returns a promise. So you'll see that's returning a jQuery promise, which happens to work and look like a normal promise, at least these days, a new jQuery. Um, so I've got my F car coming back. You'll see that if I try and do F car three dot, I'm getting complaints again. And that's because the way the, uh, we've written our code, it could return a jQuery promise but it could also be undefined what's coming back. And because I've got that strict null checking turned on, it's not going to let me use that until I assert that it is at least there. So if I have my little if check here, I'm at least now able to dot off that if things are smiling on me and they're not. No, not going to stress about it either. Thank you very much. That is exactly what it is. There we go, things do work after all. So yeah, that's, um, that's a, most of the code we're going to look at, except that the, the JavaScript that comes out of that, because it's kind of cool. So all that gets written. Now that's because we're compiling down to ES3. ES3 doesn't support generators. It doesn't support async and await. So it's made some helper functions here. You could provide your own if you wanted to. I don't really see a reason to, but some people do. So you can turn that off and supply your own. But it's going to make this whole await state machine. If you're familiar with what C Sharp does, it's the same kind of thing. It's going to make this generator. And these are helper functions again. And here's our code down here. I've got my event handler. And it's building up these states. And it's got cases. It's handling all that for us. We've just got our simple code, which happens to say, look, uh, go and call this. And uh, fcar3.engine uh, return null, doesn't matter. But we've got our code there, nice and succinct, and we can get this uh, lovely monstrosity in the browser. But if you're debugging that, though, the code's familiar enough that you can still step through it. The other thing is you've got source maps. It can make a source map for you. It can even include the JavaScript in the source map. So if you're in Chrome or IE or Firefox, wherever, it supports source maps, you can step through your TypeScript. I haven't done that too much myself lately, um, but uh, it, it is there if you need to do it. I tend to just go straight to the JavaScript, frankly. So what we didn't do today, we didn't actually run any code. Um, trust me, it's all good. Um, the React uh, demo we saw before, I kind of wish I'd seen that earlier, because I would have taken some of that and turned it into TypeScript, and we would have typed those, those props that were being played with, because there's a lot of cool stuff there that TypeScript can do to help. There's a lot of things you can do if you're a bit of a uh, type wonk, uh, if you like getting involved in such things. Um, there's things like any versus the empty type. There's different ways of fetching these externally defined type definitions. 
And the, you can also look at the TypeScript compiler itself. It's written in TypeScript after all. Uh, and the weeds can be kind of fun. Um, it's all developed in the open, so you can see uh, you know, the Grand Master there making new pull requests, explaining it to people, answering questions. You put something up there, it's answered within a couple of hours, often by core members of the team. Uh, so if you're really into it, you can get into things like mapped types, and you can take a type here and say, give me back an exact type that's like it, but everything's optional now. And you can do things like homomorphic map types, and I can't even remember what that's about, but it was an interesting read when I went to it. And people report bugs kind of like this, and it's fixed with a new pull request very shortly. You can run on the bleeding edge if you want, but generally, um, you know, there is a new release which will tend to fix things within a month or so if you do run into problems. But you can get productive without knowing most of this. Um, any is your friend, it will get you out of jail. I throw up a bit in my mouth whenever I see it, but some, if it gets you out of the tight corner, that's good. But yeah, give it a try, take a JavaScript file, rename it to TypeScript, uh, see what your editor will do for you, um, and just make sure you turn off a lot of those safety checks. So that's about it from me. Just fill out your feedback, please. Um, if you don't, that's fine, because I can win that more easily with less votes. And there's a couple of sites up there. Um, you can go to typescriptlang.org. There's a whole lot of useful stuff. There's a playground you can play with as well. It's well documented. Go to the GitHub page. And there's a couple of people in the TypeScript community who are really active, and they've written books, they've written manuals. Um, and if we bring up that, so we've got the TypeScript site. There's the playground where you can bring up some simple starting code, bringing in generics. It'll give you the JavaScript that's made on the side. The GitHub repository's there. And then there are these great, uh, this excellent book, frankly, which just goes through in much more detail than I ever could today all the things you'd want to know about getting started in TypeScript and using it in a whole lot of places and a lot of little tips and tricks too. So thank you very much for um, paying attention. Yeah, thanks.